Pali phrases for taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The word sarana, which we translate as refuge, can also mean something you remember, something you hold in mind, something you keep in mind. This is part of the way in which it becomes your refuge. You try to keep the Buddha in mind, the Dhamma, the Sangha in mind as you go through life. Try to remember the example of the Buddha, remember his teachings. And keep asking yourself, how do those apply to what I'm doing right now? How do they help me overcome suffering right now? Because that's what the teachings are all designed for, is to help you find ways of untangling all the knots of suffering that you create for yourself. They point to the fact that these knots come from within. They take some bits and pieces from outside. They take the rope from outside, say, but the knot with which you hang yourself, which with which you create a noose out of the rope, that's your doing. So you have to keep looking back at your own mind to see in what ways the mind is being unskillful. That means you take a special relationship to your thoughts. When the Buddha's life and his teachings come together is in his very last teaching. In those days, some teachers liked to save their really special teachings for the last moment. They didn't want to hand out everything to their students, otherwise the students might outshine them. And as the Buddha kept saying, he was not that kind of teacher. So instead of holding something new and unexpected for his last teaching, he simply summarized everything he taught. All compounded things are subject to arising and passing away, trying to become consummate through heedfulness. Consummate means here consummately skillful in the way you act and think and speak. In other words, bringing the mind to a point where it creates no more suffering. And it's through heedfulness that you do this. Heedfulness means, on the one hand, you see there are definite dangers, and the big ones are the ones that come bubbling up from within your own mind. One of the terms is asawa. It means effluent or fermentation. Sensual desire comes bubbling up in your mind. Certain views come bubbling up. The desire to take on states of being. Ignorance comes bubbling up all the time. And you have to develop a detached attitude towards these things. You can't just simply go along with the flow. Because after all, it is the flow of the affluence. It's not the flow of a nice, clear stream. So when things come bubbling up in the mind, you have to ask yourself, is that really so? You might put a really next to every thought that comes up and see what reasons the mind tries to give you to persuade you that, yes, this really is so, and learn how to take a detached, somewhat skeptical attitude towards what they have to say. Don't believe everything you think. At the same time, have trust in the power of your mind in order to get past the unskillful stuff. This is important as well. We don't have only unskillful habits in the mind. We do have some skillful habits that we've developed over time. If we didn't have any skillful habits, we wouldn't have been born as human beings. We'd be out there with the dogs and the cats and all the other animals wandering around. We do have a sense of right and wrong. We do have a certain amount of sensitivity. It's simply a matter that we have to learn how to develop it. 
our society and culture don't help in this area because they try to develop our sensitivities in areas that are really not helpful at all. Sensitive to what other people think, what's stylish right now, what's popular right now, what they can get you to spend your money for right now. So you have to ask, really, when you look at them as well. But they can't get at you unless your mind has a tendency, unless it wants to be popular, wants to be stylish, wants to get new things to distract itself with. So the real problem is inside. Sometimes you hear that our problem is our social conditioning. If we could get back to our preconditioned state, we'd be perfectly happy. But look at babies. They're preconditioned and they're miserable, crying all the time because they don't understand anything. They're operating under a lot of ignorance as well. And if they didn't have the seeds created by these outflows, these effluents, social pressure, social conditioning wouldn't have any effect on them at all. So it's not that things outside are at fault. The germs for our suffering are all in here. But the potential for developing skill is all in here as well. The teaching on heedfulness reflects that. If there's nothing we can do about this situation, there'd be no use in being heedful. You just sort of accept it and go along with it, because that's the best that can be done. But we do have the potential for acting skillfully. We do have the potential for learning new habits. That's where heedfulness comes in. They've done studies of people who are really skillful in external skills. And they found that one of the essential ingredients is having a very strong sense of the dangers that come when you're not skillful. People, for instance, who are really good at being surgeons have a strong sense of the damage they can do if they're not skillful, so they try to get as skillful as possible, practicing hours and hours and hours and all their delicate techniques. And so we should have the same sense of danger out there as well. It's that chant we had just now, those who see danger and respect being heedful. The two things go together. You realize there are dangers in the mind and you have to be very careful about them. And the only way to get past them is to practice for hours and hours and hours. Sitting, standing, walking, lying down all the time. Be very careful about what's coming up in the mind whether you're here at the monastery or out someplace else. It's easier when you're at the monastery. Because you have fewer distractions, fewer things pressing in on you all the time. But it's no less true that you can create a lot of danger out there as well, if you're not careful in how you react to the pressure. So you've really got to ride herd on the mind. At the same time, have confidence that you can develop skills by being observant. This is our main tool, learning how to watch. If something seems unclear, just watch it for a while. If you're forced to take action, well, take whatever seems to be the most skillful action. Keep, again, keep the Buddha in mind. His instructions to Rahula on being careful that you don't cause harm. And his constant return to this issue of being skillful. There was once a lay person who was accused by a member of some other sect that this Buddha of yours, as I said, doesn't give a straight answer to any of the really big issues of the day. He's a nihilist. He has no teaching at all. And the lay disciple said, no, that's not the case. There is one issue on which he is very clear. That's on the issue of what's skillful and what's not. And afterwards, the lay disciple went to see the Buddha and reported the conversation. And the Buddha said, yes, that's, that was a good answer. This is the important distinction. And so your question should always be, as you're trying to keep the Buddha in mind, you know, that old question, what would the Buddha do, what would the Buddha say? Well, one of the things he would say is, what's the most skillful thing to do right now? Make that your determination, that 
no matter how difficult the situation, there's always a skillful response. In some cases it may require more sacrifice on your part than part of you is willing to give. But remember, there's not just one of you in there. The mind is a whole committee. And the Buddhist teachings take advantage of that. If you simply had one self in there, how could your self do anything to improve itself? But you've got lots of different selves, and they can look at issues from different angles. And some of them have better ideas about what's skillful right now than others. So try to listen to the most skillful voice you can find inside. This is one of the reasons why we don't have to depend on an outside power. The one dependence is, again, just keeping the Buddha in mind, keeping the Dharma, keeping the Sangha in mind. Because back when I was taking a course in ethics, one of the main points that came across through the course is when you try to analyze a particular action, your idea of what's right and wrong will come from your picture of what other elements in the situation are relevant, which ones are irrelevant. And that's a lot of what ethics comes down to, is deciding what's relevant and what's not. In our case, what's relevant is that there was a person who sat under a tree 2,600 years ago and was able to put an end to suffering. And then he taught for 45 years. The fact that he, as a human being, could attain awakening. That's our main element of conviction. And that's a fact that we keep bringing to bear in all of our decisions. Because as he said, it wasn't through any special quality that only he had. He didn't claim to be a divine being or a son of a divine, be divine being. He was a human being who was able to develop certain qualities of mind that we all have in potential form. And he was able to put an end to suffering, which means it's, that event is relevant to what we're doing right now, whatever it is we're doing right now. Meditating right now or, if, or right now means washing the dishes, right now means going to work. Whatever the right now is, the Buddha's insight into how to put an end to suffering is relevant. So try to keep that always in mind. Always be heedful. Now, the dangers of giving in to the unskillful outflows or effluence of the mind. And always be heedful of the fact that you can step back and choose. to do the most skillful thing that you can think of. That right there, we start moving from the Buddha as our refuge to learning how to depend on ourselves as these qualities become more and more developed within us. And that our refuge becomes ultimately something we don't have to recollect because it's right there, always. But until that point, no, keep the Buddha in mind. Keep his last teaching in mind to be heedful. With all the dangers and the promise that that teaching entails.